Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Judge, welcome back. I'm, I mean this as good news, but it might not feel like it after me. You're half done for today. <laughs> uh, I'm 11th of 22. Uh, Mr. Chairman, before I begin my questioning, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to admit into the record a letter from Alan Gelzo, the historian at Princeton, uh, who has written a letter to the committee in response to some, some of Senator Harris's claims about uh, the history of uh, Supreme Court vacancies going back to the Civil War. Without objection. Thank you. Judge, um, you have said that the meaning of law doesn't change with time, um, and you've said that's very important. Can you unpack for us why it's so important that the meaning of a law doesn't change with time? Sure, because the law stays the same until it is lawfully changed. And if we're talking about a law that has been um, enacted by the people's representatives, you know, or gone through the process of constitutional amendment or constitutional ratification, it must go through the lawfully prescribed process before it's changed. So Article 5 in the context of the Constitution or bicameralism and presentment in the context of statutes. And it's not up to judges to short circuit that process by updating the law. That's, that's your job. But laws clearly are written in a context and then the things, the circumstances to which those laws have applied would change. Does the Fourth Amendment have nothing to say about cell phones? Unreasonable search and seizure was, was obviously not written at a time when they had imagined mobile technological devices that addicted our kids. Uh, does the Fourth right. Amendment have nothing to say about cell phones? No, the Fourth Amendment, so um, the Constitution, one reason why it's the longest lasting written Constitution in the world is because it's written at a level of generality that's specific enough to protect rights, but general enough to be lasting. So that, you know, when you're talking about the constable banging at your door in, you know, 1791 um, as a search or seizure, now we can apply it as the court did in Carpenter versus the United States to cell phones. So the Fourth Amendment is a principle. You know, it protects against unreasonable searches and seizures, but it doesn't catalog the instances in which an unreasonable search or seizure could take place. So you take that principle and then you apply it to modern technology like cell phones or you know, what if technological advances enable someone with Superman x-ray vision to simply see in your house? You know, is that, so there's no need to knock on the door and go in. Well, I think that could still be analyzed under the Fourth Amendment. So I think this is a useful place to explain to the American people again what originalism is and why it's a mistake to view it as a Republican position. I think that originalism is a part of a jurisprudential debate. It's not a part of a policy continuum between Republicans and Democrats. I think it's something that is useful for everybody who believes that three branches of government have two that are political and one that is not. So maybe it's useful to just kind of back up and say, when you define yourself as an originalist, what does that mean? And then how is it going to relate to that distinction between the principles that are timeless but the applications that are clearly going to change by circumstance? Right. So originalism means that you treat the Constitution as law because it commits these texts to writing. And in interpreting that law, you interpret it in accord with the meaning that people would have understood it to have at the time that it was ratified. And the reason that you do that is because otherwise, well, as I said, the law stays the same until it's lawfully changed. Otherwise, judges would be in the constitutional convention business of updating the law rather than allowing the people to take control of that. Now, in the case of the Constitution, as I said, with the Fourth Amendment, many of its principles are more general. Unreasonable searches and seizures. You know, free speech, those are things that have to be identified or fleshed out or applied over time. So the fact that there wasn't, you know, the internet or computers or blogs um, in 1791 doesn't mean that the First Amendment's free speech clause couldn't apply to those things now. It enshrines a principle, and we understand the principle as it was at the time, but then it's capable of being applied to new circumstances. So when, when you um, define yourself as an originalist, what are the other schools of thought that are adjacent to it? And how, how do you think about the debates among those with other people that are now with you on the, the Seventh Circuit, for instance? Sure. Well, Senator Sass, I think one thing that it's worth pointing out is that 
in the academy, in any event where I've spent a large portion of my career, originalism is not necessarily a conservative idea. There is a whole school of thought, and so originalists are now a very diverse lot. And there is a school of originalism that's more of a progressive originalism and is very committed to uh, keeping the Constitution's meaning, just interpreting text the way all originalists do to say that it was, has the meaning that it had at the time that it was ratified, but they tend to read it at a higher level of generality. So all originalists don't necessarily agree. And in fact, there's an advocacy group called the Constitutional Constitution Accountability Center, which has routinely filed briefs in the Supreme Court that calls itself, you know, it, it, it writes briefs in support of originalism, but taking it from a more progressive standpoint. So I don't think it's, I think probably people think, oh, it's only who are conservatives who are originalists, but actually it's a more widely accepted view than that. Um, I think that if you think about different strains of approaching constitutional text, Originalism is one. All judges and justices take account of history and the original meaning. It's just that some weight it differently, whereas originalists would give it dispositive weight when it's discernible. Other approaches to constitutional interpretation may take a more pragmatic view and say in some instances, well, that may have been the historical meaning, but that's an uncomfortable fit for current circumstances, so we will, um, tweak it a little bit to adjust it to fit these circumstances, that situation. Sometimes it's called living constitutionalism, that the Constitution can evolve and change over time. Sometimes it's called like a more pragmatic constitutionalism. So I just, I want to make sure we, we establish this fact clearly together, because one of the things that I think is really unhelpful for the American people when they see hearings like this over the last 20 years is there is an assumption that those of us who've advocated for you over the course of the last three years must be doing it because we know something about your policy views, and we've seen the beautiful mind conspiracy theory charts, for instance, that this is about specific outcomes that people want. What I want is to have a judge who doesn't want to take away the job of a legislator that's account a legislature that's accountable to the people. What I want is to be sure that the two political branches that are accountable to the people because they can hire and fire us are the places where policy decisions are made. So what you're saying is in the legal academy, there are people who agree with you on originalism as a broad philosophical school and yet would come out very different places on the outcomes of particular policy decisions. That is what I'm saying. So on the Notre Dame Law Faculty, uh, when you were up for the vacancy on the Seventh Circuit three years ago, the Notre Dame Law Faculty, as I understand, the letter that we got from them here, uh, had people unanimously recommend you across a faculty, and I would assume there's a pretty wide view of policy on, side, on the law, Notre Dame Law Faculty. There is. And so people can affirm that you know what the job of a judge is, you have the judicial temperament and modesty and humility about the calling, and they're comfortable with you even though they don't think they might agree with every policy view that you have before you put on your robe. Um, I, I hope that is what people think of me because that's what I've always striven to do and certainly in my time as a judge. I, my job, my boss is the rule of law, not imposing my policy preferences. So can you tell us what the black robe is about? Why do judges in our system wear robes? Well. Judges in our system wear black robes, and they started wearing black robes actually because Chief Justice John Marshall started the practice. In the beginning, justices used to wear colorful robes that identified them with the schools that they graduated from. And John Marshall, at his investiture, decided to wear, decided to wear a simple black robe. And pretty soon the other justices followed suit, and now all judges do it. And I think the black robe shows that justice is blind, we all dress the same, and I think it shows that once we put it on, we are standing united symbolically, speaking in the name of the law, not in speaking, of our, speaking for ourselves as individuals. Thank you. You, uh, in your questioning from Chairman Graham this morning, talked a little bit about the process of judicial decision making. And you started with four steps and then added a fifth and then I think added a <laughs> sixth. Um, because it turns out being a reactive branch is really reactive. Can you explain what it means that the judiciary, the Article Three branch, is reactive? 
So Article 3 of the Constitution says that courts can hear cases or controversies. So a judge can't walk in one day and say, ah, I feel like you know, visiting the question of health care and telling people what I think. We can't even think about the law or how it would apply until litigants bring a real live case with real live parties and a real live dispute before us. And the material that we have to, to, de to de decide that dispute is what comes from you. It's the statutes that you pass. We don't get to come up with the policies and see our wishes become part of the United States Code. So we react to the litigants who bring cases before us, and we apply the laws that you make. And, and what are the steps inside those Article III courts before it would ever get to a situation where the Supreme Court hears cases? What, what, what is unique about the Supreme Court? So the Supreme Court obviously sits atop the federal um, hierarchy of the judiciary. And the Supreme Court, um, so my court now, the Seventh Circuit, every time someone loses in the district courts, which are the trial courts, they can appeal. And we take every single appeal that comes. The Supreme Court works differently. Um, the Supreme Court takes cases when it needs to. Most frequently, the reason it takes them is to resolve a division among the courts of appeal or the state Supreme Courts. The Supreme Court gets about 8,000 petitions a year, and they hear about 80 cases a year. So it's discretionary um, what cases to take. So it's reactive, it's a reactive branch, and it's after a process where there's a statute, it's been challenged, there are active cases, and then it works its way up to the court. But when the justices decline to take a case, w what are they saying? What are they, they're saying you don't matter and you don't have a right to appeal? What, what, are they, what are they saying to the litigants in a case when they decline to grant cert? They're not expressing any view on the merits. They're simply saying, this isn't a case that we're going to put on our docket for certiorari because the court has obviously limited time and limited resources. And so it selects the cases where it's resolving a division, for example, in the courts or some other question on which, of national importance on which the Supreme Court needs to step in. Um, there has been a lot of discussion uh, in some of the questioning early this morning implicitly about standing. Can you just e explain what standing is so that the American people understand it? Yes. So this dovetails with your question about the judiciary being a reactive branch. So as I said, um, the Constitution gives the courts, the federal courts, the power only to decide actual live cases and controversies. So not only can we wake up one morning and volunteer our views, um, because the Constitution prohibits us from giving what are called advisory opinions. We can't just dispense advice or give our views on the law, which is one reason why I'm not able to answer some of the questions being asked today. A litigant can't get us to give an advisory opinion or elicit a view unless the litigant actually has a real case. Um, so you, Senator Sass, couldn't walk into court and file a lawsuit and just ask me to give my advice on one's, whether some particular statute was constitutional. I can only decide that question if there is an actual dispute about it. You mentioned living constitutionalism a little bit ago. Um, I think Chief Justice Warren had a much broader view of standing than some of the folks that have influenced your thinking and writing. Can you walk us through a little bit of the history of the court's view of standing over the last few decades? Um, so are you thinking about how broadly, like when a plaintiff has suffered an injury or that's a concrete injury? Right. So, so Senator Sass, if, if you came into court and you were objecting um, to a particular statute and you didn't like a particular statute, you would have to actually suffer what's called a concrete injury. So. The Supreme Court a few terms ago in a case called Spokio said that a plaintiff lacks a concrete injury if the harm isn't, um, let's see, to use words the American people might understand, palpable. Like it can't just be a procedural injury or something that didn't actually have real consequence or real effect on the litigant. Um, I think that the dispute about standing, you know, or the difficult thing in deciding questions of standing and the Spokio opinion lays this out, is deciding when an injury is concrete and courts can hear it, or when that injury is more abstract and designed to elicit an advisory opinion from the court. You said in your opening comments yesterday that it is not the responsibility of the courts to right every wrong in society. I want to ask you a question about it, but first, can you just remind us what your view is there? Why did you say that? Um, 
So I think probably what I was getting at there, although I have to say, Senator Saf, so much has happened since I gave the opening statement yesterday. Um, courts, because they are reactive, can't reach out to right wrongs that don't come to them in the case, in, in the situation of a case or controversy. And then even if they come to courts in the, in the situation of a case or controversy that a court can legitimately decide, we're not free to just resolve it like Solomon in the way that we think is wisest. Um, so we are only free to address wrongs and decide cases in accordance with democratically elected law. So the policy making is yours to do, and it is only if you have enacted policies that enable us to right a wrong that we can do so. So you still said, though, that you view it as some of your responsibility on the Seventh Circuit to write every opinion, every judgment, from the standpoint of the losing party. Explain to us why you take that perspective of wanting the losing party to understand the law and the argument. So I just write the opinion as I would write the opinion. Um, and then after I write the opinion, I read it from the perspective of the losing party because I want to make sure that like I said earlier, it, it's a check on me to make sure that if I try to put my emotions or my preferences on the other side, that I can see that it's been a balance just strictly driven by legal analysis. I also want to make sure that the language in it is very respectful to the party who will ultimately be disappointed. Um, I don't know if that, is that responsive to... Yeah, because I, why I want to ask this is because I'm, I'm in my fifth year here, or a little over five years, and I'm on my fourth year on this committee, and uh, pretty much you're, you're the third Supreme Court nominee to come before the committee during that time, and we've had uh, dozens of appellate court nominees, and I've been amazed how many times the argument is American people be really, really scared. The person sitting before us obviously hates people and wants them wants sick people to die and not have health care coverage. That's, that's sort of an argument that's routine around here. It's been focus grouped, obviously, um, as a good way to demonize uh, nominees to the court and hopefully drive outcomes in elections, I guess. I, I don't understand it. I think it's terribly destructive of the civic health. And yet, I think about it from the standpoint of thoughtful, well-meaning Nebraska Democrats who hear that, and they know I have a different policy view than they might on getting to portability and health care so people can keep their health insurance across job and geographic change, because that's actually what's driving uninsurance in America over the last few decades. It's not primarily uh, health status. It's not primarily uh, pre-existing conditions or socioeconomics. The number one driver of uninsurance in American public life uh, is that we change jobs a lot more frequently than we used to. And so I have a different policy solution of how we would get to portability and health care than a lot of my Democratic colleagues. But those are policy disputes about a modern economy where people move around a lot, both geographically and in terms of employer-sponsored uh, health insurance relationships. Those contracts are not really the things that a nominee coming before the court is supposed to opine on, because I don't have any idea what your views are on health care, but I know that it's not really the job of a judge to reflect on those things. And so I want to be sure that folks who hear this hearing, and at the end of the process, they can have trust that you're not a person who really wishes secretly um, you could be the queen of all health care and decide all these issues. And so when you write your opinion, it seems to me that one of the really humble things you're doing is you're saying, in every case that's come before me on the Seventh Circuit, I want to write this opinion from the standpoint of the losing party to understand what was the question before the court today and how did the court rule on that specific narrow thing. Because ultimately, I think you would believe, given uh, your jurisprudential tradition uh, and given your view of judicial modesty and humility and your Scalia mentorship, my guess is there are times when you rule in cases where you go home at night and you take off your robe and you think the outcome is not the outcome you wish had been the case, but it wasn't your job to ultimately decide all policy in American life. It was to decide the specific question before you. And it seems to me the humble, uh, empathetic way that you write those opinions is really important. It's also, it should be in the interest of public trust and American people uh, who might listen to a lot of the demagoguery that implies that really you're just secretly a policy actor. It should be pretty comforting to them that except for probably Justice Breyer, um, you've written more than, I think, than anybody who's currently on the court. 
so people can actually know your juris jurisprudential views and how you're going to approach cases uh, when you get on the court because you've written a ton. There's a reason why the Notre Dame faculty, regardless of their policy positions, wrote a letter to this committee universally recommending you. There's a reason why year after year on the Notre Dame Law Faculty, you were Professor of the Year because students, regardless of their policy views, thought you were really good at explaining what the job of a judge is and what the purpose of Article 3 in our constitutional system is. And as somebody who worries a lot about institutional trust um, and a lot of the attacks that we see on the court, a lot of the attempts we see in this uh, language about potentially court packing, um, if, if we would go to 11 or 13 or 15 or you know, a Venezuelan style 47 person court over the next couple of election cycles, that undermining, that delegitimizing of the courts should have as its antidote the fact that you have written a ton about what you think the job of a judge is and people can actually understand it. And I would hope that that's some of what this hearing would try to unpack. Um, I am nearly out of time and I think the chairman is gonna, gonna take away my, my slot. So I wanna, I wanna ask one final thing. Um, tell us about the Scalia-Ginsburg friendship and the, uh, the impact that it made on you. So uh, Justice Scalia famously, when the vacancy came up, I think it was Justice White's seat that Justice Ginsburg filled, but when the vacancy came open during the Clinton administration, Justice Scalia recommended her, um, even though they had been together on the DC circuit, that's where they got to know each other. And he knew that she had a different jurisprudential approach. And you know, a lot has been said in the weeks since Justice Ginsburg died about that friendship because I think it speaks so well to both of their characters that despite the fact that they had such great differences um, and they could fight with the pen, um, they, when they were socializing, when they were outside of the opinion writing world, they had respect, respect and affection for one another. And that's how I've tried to live my life with, you know, I have friends who disagree with me vehemently about all kinds of things. Um, but I, I think that it is dehumanizing if we reduce people to the political or policy differences that we might have with one another. Thank you, and congrats on being half done.